Hey everyone, we're so glad that you're joining us for Easter at home. This is a little bit different for all of us, I know. I know at Gateway, we miss shaking your hand, putting our arm around you, and having that face-to-face -face interaction. But you know, technology is great, and we still get to connect this way, and we're thankful that we still get to worship together. If you have kids watching right now, we have resources for sixth grade and under. Uh, there'll be a link in the feed below. Click that link. There'll be a Bible lesson for you to do at home. Uh, Pastor Jen Folks has put a great uh, lesson together and her team have done a great job keeping your kids connected in this time. Also, we want everybody to share this feed. Man, if you're on Facebook, hit the share button. If you're on YouTube, you can share that as well. If you're watching on the gatewayvicelia.com or on the app, you can share that link with people. And we, here's why we want you to share. Because people need hope. And there's no greater hope than that God loves us so much, our Creator loves us so much, that He sent His Son to die for us so that we can be in relationship with Him, that we don't have to fear death. And so, man, people need to hear that. We need to hear that. And so, man, share that with those that are around you. If you haven't filled out a connection card yet, please fill that out. This is a great way for us as a family, a church body to stay connected. We get your prayer requests in there. We also get to know who's watching. And if you're new here, fill that out because we have special resources and even a gift for you if you're new watching. And so we'd love to send that gift to you and connect further with you that way. We're about to head into a time of worship and a great way to start our worship is with our finances. You know, we give God our best because he gave us his best. And so you can text the amount you want to give to 84321. Also, you can go to gatewaybicelia.com. There'll be a link below, and you can click the Give tab. You give that way, you can also mail in your gift. Right now, we're going to go ahead and go to our worship band, and we're going to worship together. God bless you. and Jeff, we're uh, inviting you into our home. Uh, no matter where you are, would you please join us as we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Oh, man. 
In this time of isolation, it's good to know that Jesus walks with us and talks with us along life's narrow way. Sing with us as we sing, He Lives. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I feel His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see His loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of His appearing will come at last. And he lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, he lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, he lives salvation to
Church, this is Pastor Ed. Hey, happy Easter! He is risen! He is risen indeed! 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 Excellent! Uh, very true. You'll notice the surroundings are different. Uh, I'm at my house uh, because we were all sheltering in place and it feels really odd. I still can't bring myself to sit down and try to speak to you from the Bible. I just have to stand up. So I've got this habit. And uh, so we're going to look at 
uh, the evidence of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus today because that is what Easter is all about, uh, celebrating uh, the risen Lord. Uh, we don't want to deny the reality of that historical event. Now, the denial of reality can bring about some tragic results. A few months back, uh, Kobe Bryant got into a helicopter and the pilot thought he was high enough in the fog and all of a sudden one of the mountains in the San Gabriel uh, mountain range got in his way and they all died uh, tragically. Denying reality is not a good thing to do. So we need to know, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus reality or is it not? And so we're going to turn to the Bible. It is our number one source document to look at as we examine the resurrection of Jesus. So let's read what the Bible has to say about his death first, and then we'll deal with the resurrection after that. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and he breathed his last. And when the centurion, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way that he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Now you have to understand, centurions were hyper-responsible people. Uh, they reported to a superior above them. Uh, misleading a superior uh, was a, uh, could be a, uh, the death of the centurion. He would forfeit his death, uh, his life in that situation. And so this centurion wanted to make sure, absolutely sure, that he was telling the truth. And so when Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Mark continues, came to a prominent member of the council, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, and he gathered up his courage. Joseph gathered up his courage. He went in before Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate was wondering if Jesus was dead by crucifixion by this point, and so he summoned that centurion, and he questioned him as to whether Jesus was already dead. And ascertaining from this centurion, he granted the body to Joseph, and Joseph brought a linen cloth, took Jesus down, wrapped Jesus in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jose, were looking on to see uh, where he was laid. And so uh, some of the historical evidence of the death of Jesus Christ is the fact that uh, these centurions... Uh, put their lives on the line uh, when they pronounce death uh, by crucifixion. They wanted to make sure that guy was absolutely gone or it could come back and they could forfeit their own life. Let's look at what Luke had to say. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they, there's multiple people, most of them women. We know Peter also went to the tomb of Jesus after he was resurrected. But here in the Gospel of Luke, it's, it's the women are mentioned. And they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared because they were going to anoint the body of Jesus a second time, as was their custom. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered the tomb, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed, they were perplexed about this. Behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Uh, why are these women so perplexed or so confused? Why? Uh, because the dead do not resurrect. And, and so let's examine these two ideas. Let's examine the death of Jesus Christ. Let's examine the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's ask our most important question and then apply it to our lives, hopefully in a helpful way. Was Jesus dead after the crucifixion. Well, let's look at the 24 hours leading up to Jesus' death. Uh, he was arrested at midnight. He spent the Passover dinner with his disciples. They walked through the Kidron Valley up on the Mount of Olives, where they prayed until midnight. Soldiers came and arrested them at midnight. Jesus was on trial through the rest of that night seven times. He was up all night. Uh, he was flogged with a cat of nine tails, but before that, he was beaten and he was spit upon. He was mocked by the praetorian guard. Uh, they flogged him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They put a purple robe on his back. Uh, they punched him in the face. They abused him. And then he was taken 
out to the lictor. Uh, the lictor would strap his victim to a pole and he would give him 39 lashes because 40 lashes were considered a death penalty. More people died from uh, lashings than died from crucifixion. And so they strap him to a pole and they beat him. Uh, they crucified Jesus. He hangs there, and when they pronounce him dead, uh, he also gets stabbed in the side, and uh, blood and water flow out, showing that the serum had separated uh, from the red blood cells, showing that Jesus' heart had stopped uh, beating. And so we have all of this evidence of how Jesus died through crucifixion, and we have the historical event of all the hours of excruciating torture that Jesus went through, which caused his death. Plus, we have eyewitnesses. Uh, John was there. When Jesus is resurrected, Jesus has to say to John, Hey, reach here your finger and see my hand. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. Be not unbelieving, but believing. Uh, because Jesus wanted to prove to John that he was alive from the dead, that because John saw him die, and the, and and he was perplexed as well. How in the world can a dead guy stand here in my presence? In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. Uh, a lot of the gospel of the early church is based on the death of Jesus Christ. If Jesus didn't die, then he didn't pay for our sins, and the gospel is of uh, no value to us. But Paul says, no, Jesus did die. He died on the cross, and he paid for our sins, just like the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, let's ask the next question. Was Jesus alive from the dead? Did he resurrect? Well, we have some eyewitnesses to talk to us about that. Uh, and some of them uh, believed right away. Others didn't believe. It, it took the disciples themselves a long period of time before they came to this point of faith. Maybe you're thinking about this for the first time. It may take you a while to, to grasp the fact that Jesus actually uh, rose from the grave. You're in good company. All the disciples had that same problem. But Paul says again in 1 Corinthians 15, and that Jesus was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, uh, then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 uh, brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. Some have fallen asleep, meaning they have died. He appeared to James, he appeared to all the apostles, and last of all, Paul says, he appeared uh, to me also. Uh, the eyewitnesses believed after they encountered Jesus that he was alive. He was a human being. He was breathing and living and, and functioning as a human being after being totally dead and buried uh, in the grave. Uh, but some people have objections to the eyewitnesses. Some people say, well, you know, the writers of the Bible, uh, they were biased. They were biased toward the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, not only were they biased, uh, they were totally convinced. Uh, they were totally convinced because they encountered Jesus. They dealt with him. They talked to him. They spoke to him. They listened to him. They ate with him. Uh, they did everything that human beings do together, and they were absolutely convinced. So were the writers of Scripture biased? Yeah, worse. They were totally convinced. Uh, some people say, well, there's there weren't enough witnesses to really determine that. Well, I, I don't know if 515 witnesses are enough for you or not, but Scripture records that at least 515 people uh, saw him and encountered him alive from the grave. Another objection is, well, it was just a mass hallucination. Uh, Dr. Gary Collins, a psychologist, say, you know what, 500 people don't have the same hallucination at the same time. Uh, it's impossible for that to happen. And then some people say, well... They weren't really skeptics. They, they weren't really questioning whether this happened or not. Well, there's a very famous person in scripture by the name of Doubting Thomas, who said, unless I see him and touch his wounds and hear him, I won't believe. And Jesus walks in and says, hey, Thomas, here I am. Take a look. What do you think? And Doubting Thomas became Believing Thomas at that point. Well, what other sources besides the Bible? 
do we have? If you have your sermon notes with you, I, I quoted a man by the name of Josephus. Uh, Josephus was a Jewish man that fought against the Romans, but when the Romans conquered his city, they enslaved Josephus, and he became, uh, because he was a very educated man, he became uh, the person who chronicled uh, the Romans' war against the Jewish nation. And, and so Josephus wrote of all the battles and all of the people and all of the victories uh, of the Roman uh, Empire over Israel in 93 AD. So just a few years after Jesus was resurrected, uh, Josephus writes this about Jesus, and he was not a believer in Jesus, but he says this, about this time uh, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who wrought surprising feats. He was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He went over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ, meaning the Messiah, God in human flesh. And so some people think Josephus was a believer because of that statement. We really don't know. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day, Jesus appeared to them, restored to life. For the prophets of God had prophesied these and countless other marvelous things about him, and the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. Josephus says uh, the church uh, celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they're not giving up their belief because they were eyewitnesses, and he substantiates all that the Bible says as an outside, uh, maybe you consider more objective uh, source. Well, realize I leave out a lot of other testimony and information because we've got a short period of time. Uh, but we've come to that point in our service where we need to ask the most important question. We need to say, uh, what difference does any of this stuff make to me? So take a deep breath and together let's ask the most important question. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. So what? What difference does all this stuff make? make? Well, the thing we need to understand is the undeniable death and resurrection of Jesus is what created the unalterable faith of his disciples and their unimpeachable testimony to others about what Jesus had actually done. So what do we, what do we get out of this if we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, dead, buried, and resurrected from the grave? Well, first of all, I need to realize I can receive a pardon for my past. I, I can get a, a pardon for my past. I can gain forgiveness. Paul says in Colossians, he has forgiven us all our sins. He has forgiven us all our sins. Uh, have you ever had any regrets? Have you ever had uh, uh, any kind of uh, embarrassment or some wishes that you had done something different? Uh, have you ever been angry or envious or lustful or hateful or spiteful? You ever held a grudge? You ever been unkind or ungrateful towards people? You ever failed to speak when you should have? Ever failed to keep your mouth shut when you shouldn't have? Uh, you know, there's just, uh, uh, there's all these opportunities we have uh, for regrets and for sins in our lives. And Paul tells us that Jesus forgives all of those past sins. Secondly, I can receive power for the present. Paul writes in Ephesians, I pray that you will know how great his power is for those who have put their trust in him. It's the same power that raised Christ uh, from the dead. And so the same power that God used to raise the physical body of Jesus, uh, he will give you to live a life uh, in resurrection power. Uh, pardon for the past, power for the present, but thirdly, I can receive a promise uh, for the future. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. Uh, you'll experience resurrection just like uh, Jesus did. Uh, the undeniable death and resurrection of Jesus is what created the unalterable faith of the disciples and their unimpeachable testimony to the world. You know, that's why... Uh, this, this concern that God has for his people uh, is so important. 
Uh, Jesus changed the way the world looked at God by using the word father. Uh, Jesus wants us to know that God is like a father. He is concerned about the people of the world. He wants to pardon them. He wants to give them power. He wants to give them promise uh, for the future. I think one of the greatest stories I've ever heard about the kind of love that God has for us comes from uh, Ray Johnson at uh, Bayside. I worked for Ray for eight years, and every Easter he used to tell this story. And so I thought, what, what better story to steal and use than Ray's story that he uses uh, every Easter? And it was told uh, by an eyewitness to the event, to Ray. Uh, it's a story he got firsthand about a little 12-year-old boy playing uh, Little League. And he doesn't play much. He plays in right field, which may tell you a little bit about this guy. Uh, but he gets into his first game. It's at the end of the season. And it seemed like there were just literally hundreds and thousands of parents uh, behind the stands watching this last game because the championship uh, was going to be uh, decided. In fact, uh, this little boy's family, whole family, 60 people came to watch this a very game. And finally, he gets into the game, and it's in the last inning. There are two outs. Uh, there's a runner on base, uh, and they're, they're behind by one run. Uh, if this kid can magically hit a home run, uh, you know, he will be the hero of the entire game, and they'll win the game by one run. And he gets up to bat, and not, uh, not only is this situation just pressure-filled already, but he looks out on the pitcher's mound, and here's a six foot four, 235 pound, 12 year old as the pitcher for this other team. And he just begins uh, to sweat. Uh, he just begins to freeze up as he stands there in the batter's box. And all of a sudden, uh, this pitcher throws just this cannonball across the plate, and it's strike one. And another ball comes across the plate, and it's strike two. And finally, he decides, I I've got to dig in and I've got to swing the bat. And the third pitch is thrown. He swings the bat and it's a miss. And he strikes out and the game is over and they lose the game by one run. The opposing team, everybody stands to their feet and begins to cheer. On the other side of the field, everybody groans. And this, and this little 12-year-old guy walks back to the dugout, sits down on the bench, and he can hear all his friends on the bench along there. You idiot. You moron. You lost the game for us. You loser. And, and tears just begin to run down his face, and he hangs his head, and he pulls his cap down to try to hide his tears. And he sits there, and everybody just begins to drift away, and everybody goes home. And finally, after sitting there for a long period of time, he hears out on the ball field, Son! And he looks up, and there's his dad standing on the pitcher's mound. And there's all of his family, uh, all out uh, in the field. Uh, you know, there's Aunt Mabel at first base with the blue hair. Uh, there's blind Uncle Stan. He's out in right field. That was the right place for him. All of his family, all of his, all of his cousins are out in field. And dad says, Son, come on out. The game's not over. Come on out. The game's not over. Bring your bat. And so uh, he comes out, he stands in the batter's box, and Dad throws him a ball, and he, and he hits it out to left field, and everybody starts shouting, run, run! And so he runs to first base, and the outfield uh, guy, uh, you know, Uncle Greeley grabs the ball, throws it towards first, and overthrows it by 10 feet, and he takes off to second, and the ball goes towards second, and rolls between the legs of his relative, and he runs to third, and finally when he's at third base, he figures, I'm going for home, and he goes for home, he slides in on his 95-year-old grandmother, you know, knocking her out of the out of the home plate box, and the ball goes over her head anyway, and he's safe, and all of his relatives... Uh, gather around him. They come run around. Dad puts him up on his shoulders and they all cheer uh, because the game is won. Uh, the game is not over. The game is never over with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for this day. We're thankful for Easter. For 2,000 years, the church has been celebrating the resurrection. Not just the resurrection, but the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because Jesus died for our sins and conquered death and rose from the grave, 
Father, you can give us pardon for our past. Uh, you can give us power for the present. And you can give us a promise for the future in heaven with you. And so if your uh, head's bowed, your eyes are closed today, and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that this morning. In fact, if you'd like to do that this morning, I'm going to pray a little prayer. You can pray this prayer silently. And you can say, Dear Father, thank you that Jesus Christ died on a cross and paid for all of my sin. I put my total trust and faith in him for eternal life. Help me to live in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And thank you for the future I have with you in heaven, in Jesus' name. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity we have to examine your word, to have the historical documents that teach us about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us use this day, Easter, to point others toward uh, your free forgiveness of sin. Thank you for the celebration we can have as a family today because of what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, Gateway, have a happy Easter. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope you've enjoyed worshiping a risen Savior together. Hey, if you're here right now and you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to say congratulations. That's the greatest decision that you could ever make. We're so proud of you. If you could take a moment, fill out a connection card, just mark, I accepted Jesus today. We want to personally reach out to you. We want to connect with you and help you on this brand new journey that you've started. Also, next week, we're starting a brand new sermon series entitled Authentic Living. How to authentically follow Jesus. How to be real in your relationship with him. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a great time of worshiping together and growing in our relationship with God. Hey, if you haven't had the opportunity or you would like to, to give today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321. You can go to our website, gatewaybicelia.com. You can also mail that in. God bless you, Gateway Church. Have a great week.